sort of the good fortune we have um, received over the past couple of days. And um, you know, we're all excited about getting the number one pick. And uh, a lot of good stuff has happened to us the f past few weeks. And, um, you know, as I said, in New York, I just feel blessed about the opportunities, and yet I'm, I'm mindful of all the work that is ahead of us as an organization, as a coaching staff, and as players. And um, <clears throat> at the same time, I'm excited about the prospects. So I uh, can't tell you guys how I felt um, when I was on stage in New York. I uh, still can't describe that, but uh, it was a good feeling. And i um, just really happy about uh, the opportunity to have uh, the first and the tenth pick, and so uh, we got a lot of work to do, but we're in a good spot. You know, like I told the guys in New York, we got a, a lot of work to do. Um, obviously, there's a consensus number one uh, on a lot of people's boards, but. Um, it's irresponsible of me to start talking about one particular person. I haven't sat down with Dell and Hugh and uh, the Benson family all in one room to talk about that. So I'm not going to uh, take that step and be irresponsible. It's not, it's not my job to do that. I mean, they, these people come up with this stuff every year, I think. You know, I think Chicago had a really low percentage when they got Derrick Rose. Uh, when LeBron went to Cleveland, you know, I remember when 10 came out, everybody thought Boston was going to be the team that got the pick. And I don't mind all that stuff. I mean, people are going to write and say what they want to say. Um, the bottom line is we have the pick. And, and, and we've been an organization that believes in no excuses and no explanations. And, you know, we feel fortunate that we got the pick. Um, I like Commissioner Stern's approach. He just kind of laughs it off and he keeps going. And um, we're going to do the same thing. I don't feel vindicated. I don't feel, you know, I've said this before, we didn't deserve the number one pick. Um, you know, it's not like you strategize to get it. I don't know how you do that. You know, we felt like we had to send a message to our, our young guys. Um, it was what we do, play hard and, and try to win no matter what. We had a good fan support going down the stretch. And the last thing they wanted was to have a team come in there and just, you know, lay down. Um, but I don't feel vindicated. You know, I've, I've heard that before and, and, and I've had some, <laughs> my phone and has been ringing off the hook, unfortunately, since uh, the lottery draft balls went up and, and people are saying that we deserve it and all that. I, I don't get into all that. I think um, you get what you get and you try to do the best you can with that. And um, I'll always feel that way. I mean, we won 21 games, you know, so obviously um, we got to get better as coaches. We have to improve um, our young core. That's why they're in the gym right now. They've been in the gym for two weeks uh, working on their games three hours a day. And, um, you know, I've talked about getting length for two years. Uh, really hit me in the face last year in the playoffs when we were playing against the Lakers and we were driving to the basket and all I saw was, you know, arms and legs um, from the Lakers. And, I, you know, you look around the league and most of the dominant teams have uh, length. And so that's something that would serve us well. Um, we need guys who can put the ball in the hole. 
you know, I get a lot of slack for we don't score enough. And then when I look at all the tape at the end of the season and we chart how many open shots we miss, it's a lot of open shots. So we need guys who can put the ball in the hole. So with two picks in the top ten, you can you can cover some needs. And yet at the same time, those guys are not going to save your organization. You know, people have to understand that these kids are um, 18, 19, 20 years old. It just doesn't work that way. And so you're talking about drafting guys who will fulfill those needs maybe two or three years from now. You'll start to see the fruit of hard work and and, and see their talent come out even more. Yeah, I do. I, you know, <laughs> it was written that I said the draft was a weak draft. I, I don't know where that came from. I, I just said they weren't guys who were I didn't see a LeBron, I didn't see a Tim Duncan in this draft, but I see some guys who can put the ball in the hole. And the more I watch film, I wasn't able to watch it down the stretch because it was focused on our team so much, but the last few weeks I've been able to watch uh, guys who could score in tough spots. You know, I was watching different guys in tournaments or in their conference tournaments make big plays. And um, I think there's some guys with some great upside. You might not see it in the first two years, but once they get used to the league, I think um, they could potentially be, you know, big-time scorers in the league in the right situation. Um, you just you look at a guy like Russell Westbrook, who wasn't a shooter; he was a defender. And now he puts the ball in the basket with, with ease. Uh, Dwayne Wade was not a shooter per se. He could score, and now he's increased his range. I don't think anybody saw him being this kind of a player. I think he was fifth pick, if I'm not mistaken. Um, if they could do that draft over again, he'd, he'd go higher. you know. But I, I do see some guys with that kind of ability. And um, we're going to get a, a chance to put our hands on those guys and, and see if they can do it here in our gym and uh, make a good decision from there. Mm -hmm. Well, for us, we have two good point guards. Um, the unfortunate side is one of them is a free agent next year, and so he could potentially get a better offer from another team. That's Jared Jack. But we have two guys who, who played really well for us. That was a position that was covered this year. Uh, do you draft a, a point guard and, and you know develop him and, and see if he can be the point guard of the future? That that's a possibility. Um, Del and I have talked about that, but. Um, when you have two picks, it gives you the option to do that, especially when you have the number one pick that covers a number of, of bases. And then with that tenth pick, you could opt to, to draft a, a point guard and, and let him marinate for a while, or if he's good enough, you play him right away. Can I say his name? Okay. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, how do I sum up? Well, defensively, he's above and beyond most college guys uh, defensively. I think, you know, he blocked 15 three-point shots. You, you don't hear about bigs doing that. You don't hear about anybody blocking 15 three-point attempts. Uh, and his ability to cover ground and, and the willingness to play defense is something that most guys don't care about. You know, if, you, if you ask all of the guys who are in player development right now and working with all these gurus who do all this off-season stuff, not one of those guys is working on defense. They don't do it. They, they go and they work on you know, their left to right crossover, shooting threes, end of game shots. Nobody works on defense. And Davis is a guy who has the instincts to play defense at a high level right now. And you know, He's one of the few guys that's come into the league. Um, I mean, you talk about Elijah Wan, David Robinson, Tim Duncan. Those guys came into the league with the propensity to change a game defensively without even scoring a bucket. And, and he has that ability. 
mind you, he's he's young, and so it's going to take him a while to understand the tendencies of certain guys. Uh, three seconds, uh, he didn't have to deal with that in college. You, know, you can't sit in the lane the whole time, but he certainly has the length and the ability to get up and down the floor to change uh, the game from a defensive um, standpoint, and then his ability to distract shots, which I think should be a stat, personally, the ability to distract uh, somebody's shot, because a lot of times guards get to the lane and they're shooting that floater, and if you can get a guy to shoot the floater two feet higher than he normally shoots it, that's a distraction, and that helps your team, and I think he, he has that ability, so offensively, all these guys, they just get better, because they work on it all the time, and um, from what I've, I've gathered, He's in the gym working on his game every day, getting ready um, for his big moment. And um, it's certain, he's certainly a guy that we're looking at. <laughs> No, I don't think so. I, I don't know if you can look at this year as a a reference point for grading things with 66 games and all the injuries. Um, I, I still think low post scoring is a premium in the NBA. And I, you know, if you look over the long haul in in our past. Low post scoring, whether it came from a big man or a guard, uh, is the way to go because it opens up the floor. Um, there's so many athletes now who can get up and down the floor, and and the game is is more fun. I would, you know, most of you would say, but I I still think the way to go is to have a a guy who can get you some points in the hole. Uh, the problem. I, I see is that there are a few guys who can do that, but they don't have the compliments outside who can just knock down shots. That's the thing that's probably not as consistent with today's game as it was back in the day. There was guys who could just flat out shoot the ball every single night. Now there are guys who can score, but they just don't shoot it as well, and it doesn't complement an inside game. Um, and so I still think you know Tim Duncan is the best. Uh, he may not be playing that way right now against OKC, but he's he's a, a post-up option that gives other guys freedom to play well on the perimeter. Yeah, I mean, See, I, I'd be lying. I, I don't watch as much college basketball as everybody else does, just because you're so focused on on the pro game. But I, you know, Durant when he came out, I had the privilege of working him out in Portland when uh, we were drafting those guys, and uh, I'd never seen anybody have a workout like that. And then I watching the film and all the stuff you heard about him, I, I was like, this kid is amazing. But I, I didn't know he was going to be what he is right now. But Back then, he was the best that I had seen come out. And Brandon Roy, when he came out, I was like, man, this kid is, is ridiculous. And, you know, I haven't had a chance to put my hands on um, Anthony to see what he'd be like in the gym and, and, and putting him through drills and seeing him do some things. But he's certainly on film. Uh, defensively, I you haven't seen many guys play at that level. Uh, I think it was a championship game. I don't know where he, you know, he... I guess he said he wasn't worried about scoring. He just wanted his teammates to do that. He would control the game defensively. You just don't hear guys talking about the game in that way, especially on the college level. But uh, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say he he's Durant or Brandon or LeBron. But defensively, I think he might be the, maybe the best we've seen in a long time. Uh, I go back to David Robinson and, and Elijah Wan. Those guys were off the chart defensively. Mm. 
feel the same way. I mean, don't get me wrong. This is really cool for us, and I feel blessed that we have the number one pick. But as I've said before, my job never changed, and I, I want to keep that focus. You know, no matter what the situation is, ownership, players wanting to leave, number one pick, the bottom line is my job hadn't changed. And my focus is always to try to get better, to continue to talk to other coaches and keep watching um, other guys' practices when I can get them on film and DVD to try to get better. And I don't feel like... Um, I have anything to gloat about because we haven't done anything. You know, my, my goal has always been to win a championship, and that's what I was taught when I was in San Antonio. You know, you, you, you do this to win a title, Ma, and that's that's what you do. And and uh, having been in that environment and been around Pop and, and that system has taught me to, to keep pounding the rock until you get to that point. And everything else that surrounds that is just stuff. You know, I, I feel like we have good problems in the NBA, and uh, all you got to do is drive to the Ninth Ward or, you know, take a ride with me to Rivard Detention Center and see what some of these young kids are having to deal with, and it puts things in perspective for me. Um, you know, my kids have never, they don't know where the light in the refrigerator comes from because it's always full. And so, I, you know, I'm constantly trying to get them to keep my mindset that stuff happens, but you gotta, you got to deal with it. you got good problems, and I have good problems. So I feel good about where we are, but yet I'm mindful of where we need to go. It's going to take a lot of work, and uh, it's not going to happen just because we got the number one pick. That, that's not the number one pick's responsibility. It's our responsibility as an organization to do everything we can to try to make all this stuff work. Other needs, uh, you know, the one thing I saw last year is uh, Jared, Jason, and Marco had to carry the leadership role. Uh, we could probably use a couple more veteran guys who understand the day in and day out grind of dealing with me, dealing with the kind of practices that we um, execute every day. It takes a certain kind of leadership and uh, we lost some of that with uh, not having Willie. Uh, David West was a guy who commanded respect in the locker room, and um, you know we we, we lost some of that. And so, along with the talent, I think you have to add guys who understand what it takes to to be a pro. When you get to January and February, and it's getting dark outside earlier, and guys don't want to practice, you got to have leadership on the team that. Uh, coaches in the locker room and they, they help the coaches facilitate the message to the young guys and so if we can add some some sound vets um, that understand what we're trying to do that would be good as well My feeling about all that is guys, either they want to be here or they don't want to be here. I don't think the number one pick is going to persuade guys um, totally, but I think it's an attraction. You know, They may not admit it, but it, it's an attraction. I don't care what anybody says, especially when you have uh, the kind of prospects like this draft has. And um, at the same time, Guys are going to get other offers from teams, and so that weighs into the equation as well. Um, but it, you know, I, I get a little—I'm tired of guys.
guys always wanting things to be perfect before they come to a team. It's just it's not going to happen. And, and we treat these guys like they, they have problems. I mean, you're talking about guys who are going to make 13 to $17 million, and they're sitting there whining about, you know, well, I need more help. Uh, when you make that kind of money, you are the help. And, and there's no other way to put it. And that's you should be attracting guys to come play with you, not a rookie. And so I don't want to put that kind of pressure on, on any young guy who's 18 or 19 years old. They are an, tr an attraction, but it's not like it was back in the day when you were getting three- and four-year college guys who were the attraction, like a Tim Duncan or an Elijah Wan or a Patrick Ewing. It's totally different now because the guys are so much younger. Um, I forgot the second part of your question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of things will help with that. You know, having ownership, number one pick, um, you know, our city, I think that is an attraction to guys. Uh, and I think the fact that our organization has weathered the storm without any scandals, without any foolishness going on, we just kind of plowed and, and continued to do our work. I think guys see that. Um, I've talked to guys who, I won't name names, but I've talked to a few guys who, who want to come here and play. Um, unfortunately, they're under contract. There's <laughs> only so much you can, you know, you can say. But um, I think guys see the style of play, and uh, they see young guys getting better here. You know, Jason Smith, Marco Bellinelli, they're like flagships for our player development program. I think all those things are an attraction. And uh, it's New Orleans. I mean, people come here all summer long to do essence or uh, eat and other stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of things that can attract a, a good free agent. It's, I think it's up to us to target who that guy is and make sure he's the right guy. Yeah, not really. I don't think you know it, it, the coaches who are who attract players in the NBA are you know, Popovich, Doc Rivers, um, you know, Coach Adelman. He's somebody that you know guys want to play for. When they look at a team, they're like, man, I'd, I'd like to play for that guy because they've kind of been there and done that. Um, I know that when Coach Riley was a coach, he was an attraction. You know, those guys are Coach Brown. They're staples in the NBA. They're fixtures. Um, as I said before, I've, you know, I've, I've not done anything. I got a, a ways to go. Lord willing, I get the opportunity to do it. And you know, I don't, I don't see anybody, you know, man, I want to go play for my knocking down the door. If, if they heard about my practices and how anal I am in practice, they'll be like, I don't know. Um, I think the style of play could be attractive to guys. And, and understanding that we try to help guys get better and we treat people well here, we'd like to think we do that. And, and that, I think that stems from our organization as a whole.